Hey, welcome back to the Zombie Tactics channel today with a, a subject I hope of some interest to you today. Blooding the Gun, part of the Gun Fu series. And uh, on the table, you can't see it, but I've got a number of handguns and I'll show pictures of them. They've all been um, obviously chamber checked and all that good stuff for you safety sallies. I do in fact have a couple of magazines as well for one of the guns and it's been loaded with some dummy rounds for purposes of demonstration. That's been checked over and over about three times, so, you know, you can relax. Uh, to open this subject, I want to talk a little bit about something that I have found common to people who are firearms aficionados or, or uh, practitioners of martial arts and things like that. Um, Civil War reenactors, you know, those kinds of folks, anything along those lines. And it is that there is a general fascination with what um, I guess you could call... Um, martial uh, lore or warrior lore or uh, in another way is just history but it's really more about culture customs and things like that than it is just about you know dates and facts and figures that a, that a more straight study of history would be and this lore has to do with learning why things came to be and how they affect our way of thinking about things like weaponry and tactics and stuff like that today and even common you know citizen type stuff. You know, for instance, the, the, the good old, you know, military salute, whether it's like this or this or whatever, that all comes from uh, the fact that in, in, in uh, medieval uh, Europe, when a knight was in full armor and on horseback, he had a, a face helmet on and you couldn't see who he was. So both for the purposes of showing that you were friendly and as a symbol of honor, you know, you, you're approaching another knight on horseback, well, you lower your lance and the arm that you would normally use to hold your lance up with, or a sword, or something, you use that one to lift your faceplate like this, which simultaneously lets the other guy see your face, which, you know, means he could find out who you are and come get you later, <laughs> and also to show you, hey, I'm friendly, I'm not here to hurt you, I'm putting my face mask up, if my face mask was down and I was going for the lance, It'd be a different subject altogether, and that's where the salute comes from. Similarly, the, the typical handshake that we have in Western culture, we theorize it kind of comes from the idea that when two men were meeting each other, you know, Og and Grog, that Og would put out his hand to show, see, I not hold rock, that kind of thing, <laughs> so that you can show that you're friendly, and this comes into play into common day. Um, well, a couple of things are of uh, interest to me along the lines of, of, uh, of warrior lore, and that is that when I look back into the history of both medieval uh, Europe as well as feudal Japan uh, in particular, we find some concepts having to do with how you should always handle weapons and uh, what that means about you and what it has to do with the seriousness with which you approach um, a piece of weaponry. In the Bushido Code, or certain derivations of it, for instance, it was very common, a couple of things having to do with blooding a sword. You would never remove your sword in certain uh, certain applications of the Bushido Code unless you were actually going to bloody it, meaning it was going to cut something before it came back into the sheath. And that was sort of both symbolic of the fact that the sword is a weapon, it's to be taken seriously, it's not to be taken lightly, but also um, the seriousness of the operator, of the swordsman, that he would treat this weapon with great respect, that it was not a toy to be played with. <laughs> Similarly, it was said that a sword could not be brought into battle um, unless it had been first blooded, and that would mean all kinds of things, some of them fairly benign, like they would temper a sword in in the, the blood of some animal, and some of them fairly nasty in certain time periods and in certain places in Japan, blooding a newly forged sword meant you were going to go find some peasant and just hack him to death with it. I mean, that's pretty brutal, and we're not talking about doing anything like that today. And there were similar concepts in Europe as well. The idea that a sword had to go through a, a process, a, a, a way of being proven, and it often involved some kind of process of blooding of the sword before it was considered worthy to be given to a knight or to any warrior worth his salt. Well, fast forward to today, and you know I call this video the blooding of the gun, blooding the gun. Why? 
and it's because I'm going to apply this principle, the idea that you must treat the weapon with respect and that it has a purpose in mind, add a couple things to, to it and share you a principle that I'm going to use in my own personal gun foo. The three guns that I have before me are a Ruger SR9C, that's the compact model of the SR9, and this is my primary carry pistol these days. A Springfield XD, this is the 40 caliber model, and a Glock 22, which is chambered in 40 caliber Smith & Wesson as well. I also have a 9mm conversion barrel for this in the magazines that go with it. Two of these guns, um, I feel, are trustworthy to be used for my own self-defense or in combat, if you will, although I'm just a citizen, I'm not a law enforcement officer or anything like that, so the idea of combat maybe is a little bit silly. But nonetheless, I only trust two of these weapons to use for self-defense. And you probably guess one of them, because I said it's my primary carry pistol, and you'll probably guess one of the other ones based on all kinds of factors, but probably not having to do with what I'm talking about. Because again, I'm talking about blooding the gun. Well, what is blooding the gun? Blooding the gun means that I have put this Ruger SR9C through enough in the way of testing it out to know that I can rely upon it. I've put this uh, pistol through several um, tactical weapons handling courses where it has never failed me and uh, I haven't had any problems with it. I know that the manual of arms which involves things like a, uh, a magazine disconnect, a manual safety, which is ambidextrous, a loaded chamber indicator, which if I load a dummy round, you'll see on camera, flips up right here. Uh, I've learned how all of these things work together, and I've learned to trust the operation of this gun, as well as its basic accuracy and reliability. It's not simply a question of the fact that the gun is of high quality. It is that I have applied myself to the use of this weapon system enough that I'm comfortable with it. In other words, I've run myself hard and I've run my, my gun hard in the process and that is a process of blooding the gun. Why? Because in almost every case if you're gonna run that gun and yourself hard enough through some kind of training for course or a run and gun scenario or you go out to some BLM property or some private shooting property that allows you to just get a little crazy and you practice with this gun and you practice you know all the ways that you're gonna use it you're gonna find oh you know my slides locked back I've gotta hurry up I gotta get that gun into bear you know or anything like that uh, get it back into battery that you're comfortable with everything about the operation of the gun you do that hard enough you run yourself and the gun hard enough and believe me there will be blood involved I'll throw in a picture here of uh, a recent little bit of blooding myself I've got blood all over my hands and as a such I got blood all over the gun too. Uh, the gun is now blooded. It's trustworthy and I'm trustworthy with the gun as well. The same goes for the Glock 22. Aside from the reputation of the Glock pistol series as quality handguns, just that reputation is not enough for me. I've run this actual Glock 22 mine both with 40 caliber and by changing out the barrel and putting in a conversion barrel with 9 millimeter through the ringer, through my own little scenarios, my own trainings, running that gun hard, really, you know, putting myself to the manual of arms of this gun, which in this case doesn't have any safety features except the, you know, the, the triple safety mechanism that's internal to the Glock. It's a safe gun, uh, but no external safeties or anything like that. Everything about it, I can operate, and I'm comfortable that I can operate the gun, and the gun is reliable. Okay? So put that on the table. Now, the XD40, I don't trust yet. And some of you who are not uh, Springfield fans will say, yeah, I wouldn't trust it either. But the reason I don't trust it is because I have not run this gun enough in enough situations to know that everything about this manual of arms is comfortable for me. For instance, the backstrap safety here. I have not run this in enough hard situations to know that in kind of under time pressure or some other kind of stress, I might not fully engage that backstrap safety and allow me to operate the gun. If that backstrap safety is not fully engaged, you can't even rack back the slide. So I've got to make sure I'm comfortable with the gun and that the gun is basically reliable as well. 
then the gun will be blooded because I guarantee you by the time that I've run this gun through that process there will be blood involved. <laughs> That's the concept of blooding the gun and it's one that I'd like you to think about. Even if you don't actually bleed, uh, making sure that before you trust something with your life that you've sufficiently run it through something hard, not just going out to the range and plinking off a couple of rounds, but actually run that system hard, run yourself hard using that system so that you know that you're comfortable with it. Then and only then is the gun properly blooded and ready to be used for your self-defense or anti-zombie purposes. That's zombie tactics for today, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.